Okay, everyone. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to today's seminar organized by GRL EDI team and the Race Equity Network, or REN for short. My name is Piv Gopalasingham. My pronouns are he and him. I work as a scientific training officer in Emble EBI, and I'm delighted to be hosting this talk today. Um, I have with me also um, esteemed members of the management committee who are here with us, Shika and Tapiwa. They probably don't like that I'm calling them out here, but they're fantastic members here, so you should definitely get talking to them after lunch if you have a chance. October is Black History Month in the UK and a time for education around issues affecting the country's Black communities, their history, and a celebration of their achievements. There are many. During this month, I invite you all to take part in BHM as fully as you can, and I'll say a few words about this towards the end. One of Wren's goals is to raise awareness around issues with race and ethnicity dimensions on campus, be it staff welfare or science. Today's seminar concerns the latter and some of the history around things, and I'm delighted to introduce our speaker, doctoral researcher Sasha Henriquez. I will say a few words about Sasha before we start. Sasha is a Principal Genetic Counselor at Guy's and St. Thomas Hospital in London, and is also a PhD student studying issues around race, ethnicity, data bias, communities, genomics, uh, which is why she's here on the campus doing a PhD with uh, the Welcome Connecting Science and the Faculty of Education at the University of Cambridge. So it's a real pleasure to have you with us today. I think this is the first PhD of its kind on campus, which is definitely historic and definitely going to be very knowledgeable for everybody involved. I will pass over to you. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. <laughs> so um, that was a lovely introduction. Um, so good afternoon, everyone, everyone who's here, everyone who's online. Um, I'm not looking at you because it's intimidating. This is enough. Um, I uh, don't often get told that I'm too loud, so my first apology is actually I've been a little bit sick and my voice is a little bit weak, which is um, quite new for me. <laughs> so if I fade into oblivion, please just tell me to be a bit louder. Also, I've got a bit of a cold, so I have a really like mad cough that keeps popping out every now and then. So I apologise for that in advance. Um, but yeah, let's get started. So, um, where are we? So, this is me. <laughs> and I decided um, to talk today um, a little bit about where I am. Um, as has said, and been said, this is a new page PhD. Um, this is a first, um, and it's a first for me in lots of ways as well. So I wanted to use this analogy that I wanted you to keep in your mind as I talk of thinking of me as this happy-go-lucky girl with her pigtails. And the reason that I've chosen um, this to represent me is that when I embarked on my PhD journey, um, I was very aware, given my experience of being a Black woman in genetics, the topic that I was asked to study about my well-being, about how I would be looked after, about the impact that doing this work as a black woman around this topic would have on me. So I was really adamant that I wanted another black academic female to support me. So um, I have a mentor and we had a meeting and she has a few other black women who are her PhD students. And we were talking about the impact of working in academia, the impact of our clinical work, some people work in politics, and we all kind of shared these experiences of aggressions, you might want to call them micro, sometimes they don't feel very micro, and we were kind of sharing these experiences with, with each other, and it was like really cathartic, and she said to us, you know what you all sound like to me, you sound like these little girls running along with your pigtails, like how life is so wonderful, and then every now and then the reality of being a black woman in this world kind of slaps you in the face. And what are you going to do about that? How will you look after yourself? What are you going to do about your well-being? Where are you going to talk about that? How are you going to carry that with you? So I am just asking a favour really is if you could carry that with you throughout this talk um, so that you can kind of understand the angle that I've decided um, to come from. I won't be talking too much about the particulars of my PhD, but hopefully I'll touch on it in, in, in certain ways and we can definitely um, take it to the questions and ask some more questions about that. Um, okay, so let's go. So first, la di la di da, this is me started about a year ago, everything was so exciting. Um, and so some of you may have seen this wonderful blog about this new PhD that was coming and it told you all about me. And, and honestly, it was like a real um, 
momentous occasion, I think, for the campus, um, I think for Welcome Connect in Science and for me as well. Um, so you don't have to go ahead and read that, but there's a little bit in that blog that talks about my journey as a clinician. So I'm a genetic counsellor, as was said to you, and so I worked with patients who have genetic conditions for kind of over 10 years. And there were a number of kind of burning issues that came to me during that work, and some of which has driven me to do the PhD. And so that was kind of where I was when I started genetic counselling, this wonderful profession that I discovered like in my 30s. Why had I not known about this before? It's so great. I'm so glad that everybody gets to access this and everybody's been treated wonderfully with this wonderful um, kind of service and then pow. And like, actually, it's not, it's, not, it's not like that for everyone. Um, everybody kind of doesn't look like me. I've gone from being the only in the room in so many different ways and I still am. I've been in this job for years and I still have never met a genetic counsellor who looks like me, who comes from where I'm from, who talks to the patients in the same way that I did. And so, la 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 la, I decided that I would skip off and go to South Africa and see if I could learn something more about genetic counselling, learn something from black genetic counsellors. And I got there and there weren't any. Um, so I was like, oh, okay, so maybe this is not just a UK thing, like maybe, maybe this means something, maybe there's something going on here. And in fact, when I got back, I was in um, South Africa for a year and a half, and it was wonderful, absolutely wonderful. I loved the team, um, I loved the work that I was doing, I loved the hospitals that I worked in, I loved the country. It was complex, it was challenging, um, but I really, really, really did enjoy my time. But being there and seeing those disparities in a different cultural setting that was not my own, in a different community that wasn't my own, um, kind of inspired me to come back and, and be part of a change really in my own, in my own world. And so when I came back, um, these two things happened after I'd left. Um, so I know both of these people, so um, Barry and Malebo. So Barry, I had met before he um, decided to become a genetic counsellor. So the first thing that I said in the meeting, which didn't go down very well when I got there, was, oh, why have you not got any black genetic counsellors? And then everyone kind of went a bit quiet. Um, and so, uh, but that changed, you know, and, and it got to be quite intentional. And um, I remember speaking to Barry and Barry talking about, um, you know, wanting to be a genetic counsellor and the work that he'd done before and kind of really speaking about what a wonderful position he had as a man in genetics, as a black man that speaks an African language in genetic counselling, all these wonderful parts of genetic counselling that I really enjoyed that he would be able to do that I really couldn't do in South Africa with my patients. I could do lots, but there was something that was missing. And then um, Malebo, I met just through Twitter. So I saw the Twitter about her being South Africa's first genetic counsellor. She was in Cape Town, a completely different part of South Africa than I'd worked in. And so I tweeted her back and said, oh, technically it was me, um, but I'm not South African, so I'll let you have it. <laughs> so, um, so that's how we started talking. Um, and we talk all the time and um, we're really good kind of friends and colleagues now. Um, what that illustrates is just how small Black genetic counselling is um, that I can honestly say within the UK and South Africa it wouldn't take me very long to get all the black genetic counsellors in one room um, but that's not just us um, as I said you know there are global reasons why representation in genomic counselling particularly of the pleasant presence of black people in genomic counselling is just not where it should be so um, the data that we have here at Sanger shows that about 0.7% of people who were asked kind of identify themselves as black. We, when we look at the globe and we look at the amount of genetic counselors based on populations, some of the largest populations have the least amount of genetic counselors. And when we look in um, science and research and funding, we see the same problems again and again and again. So this is a global problem. Um, so that's why there's a big globe, clever, huh? So, <laughs> So lots of people are thinking about what they need to do about this problem. So there's one example here from the National Human Genome Research Institute, which says the promise of genomic services, I can't even read it, cannot be fully achieved without successfully attracting, developing and retaining a diverse workforce. That includes people from groups currently underrepresented in genomics enterprise. So it's, you know, it's across the board. So one of the things that I thought was interesting when we think about attracting genomic scientists to the, to the profession is about kind of who gets funding and, and why they're supported. And I found this 
really interesting and I'll touch on it again as well. Um, but when they looked at the funding gaps in NIH based on, um, on uh, ethnicity, um, one of the biggest attributes of the funding gaps was the topic that they'd chosen. Um, and so notably it said here that African-American and black participants um, put, put, uh, proposed research topics that have lower award rates because the research topics are often around community and population. So given that we've just said like what an important thing this is, that actually these are the things that get the lowest score. So what are we really saying about what's important to genetics and what gets awarded the most? So I don't know why I threw it in there. It doesn't even make sense for it to be there, but it just kind of stopped me. <laughs> I thought I'd put it there. So then, you know, la, 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 I'm going on with my journey. I decide to be an academic. I come and do a PhD. And then I think, oh, what happens to you after you do a PhD? You might go into academics and become a professor. And then you look at the statistics of black women professors in the UK. 22,000 professors and 41 of them are black women. Um, if you can find the genetic ones, then please let me know. <laughs> so, um, so what? So what does, what does that mean? So obviously my first thought is um, as, a, as a genetic counselor, as somebody who sits in clinic, thinking about what does it mean to have a workforce that doesn't represent the patient group that you see? What does it mean when you are holding people in their most vulnerable states, when you are asking them to share their values, their beliefs, um, in order to make decisions about their lives? And there's a barrier there that can't be reached or could be better reached or easier reached um, if there was more diversity within the workforce or a workforce that was more comfortable with diversity. And that's a really important distinction. We'll touch on that again later. So um, COVID really showed us, didn't it, that um, this, um, this disparity um, that we see in health um, is not just genetics, that it's universal. And actually, um, you know, notably from this, um, the six domains that were in the Marmot review um, after the COVID mortality rates, there were two extra domains that were added. So one was around environmental sustainability and the other was to tackle racism and discrimination. So it's here, right? We're talking about it. It's, it's, it's everywhere, but, but what's going on? So in addition to, as I said, these outcomes, um, there were, these outcomes are just not equal for everyone. This disparity that we're seeing is also the same in genetics. Everyone wasn't accessing genetics in the same way. So I had personal experience of this. I mentioned going to work in South Africa and I would see patients light up um, because it was a very different system to the UK. You would have patients and they would all arrive really, really early in the morning and then all the notes would be stacked up and it would just be a first come first serve, really different to the UK where they're put into our clinics. So that means the patients sit there and watch clinicians walk in and out of the room, knowing where they've come in in the time of day and who's gonna pick up their file. So it's really tangible that you can see people, their expectations rise when I go to pick up um, their notes. And then they'll say to you, oh, I'm really glad it was you. And then you get in and I speak <laughs> the Queen's English. <laughs> um, and so they speak to me in their, in their local vernacular on their mother tongue. Um, and, <laughs> um, and I can't help them. And they look a bit crestfallen, but still they don't quite believe me. So they kind of coax me into it a little bit. And so I picked up a lot of kind of little bits of vernacular Zulu just by, because they were forcing me to. Um, and so, you know, this, this is something that there was really stark to me, because as I said, I'd pointed out that actually, when I looked at the genetic workforce in South Africa, a lot of them didn't speak South African languages. So I wasn't, it wasn't even that I was from somewhere else. Um, and, you know, what, what could be done about that? And so um, part of what I chose to do while in South Africa, and, and when I came back, was to kind of develop a bit of a conversation and a workshop for trainee genetic counselors about having these conversations across cultural barriers. How do we, how do we um, shorten that gap a little bit more? How do we appreciate it a bit more, take a bit more time to meet those needs that we can see are clearly there? So um, one of the other experiences that I had um, when I came back from South Africa was um, I worked in cardiac genetics for a while. And I had um, an older gentleman and his wife, and he had just been diagnosed with cardiomyopathy. 
Um, and so I was doing a family tree because he was older to see if this was genetic cardiomyopathy or maybe something else. And during the family tree, it um, was clear that they also had a history of sickle cell. So they were both sickle cell carriers and had children affected by sickle cell. So I kind of had to explain dominant inheritance and I had to explain recessive inheritance because they still hadn't quite got their head around that. So it was years ago, their children were all grown and why and his his wife almost seemed a bit like well why don't I also have the cardiopathy thing she was a little bit jealous even um, so we were kind of talking about that and then we had to talk about next generation sequencing and so it was a lot and I just gave up on my Queen's English actually because I do have another language and my other language this was a Jamaican family is Patwa because actually this is the, lang the second language that my grandparents spoke when they were at home this is the language that my mum spoke before she came to live in the UK when she was five and I went to school in Jamaica when I was nine years old so actually I ended up doing my genetic counselling in kind of a bit of English and a, and a bit of Patwa which was wonderful for me actually um, and so this is um, Louise Bennett so when I was young and we were growing up my mum would play us poetry by Louise um, Bennett and she featured about two weeks ago on Google if you notice when they put the famous people on Google Louise Bennett was on there and um, so that every Jamaican had that up that was amazing so um, so I think Louise Bennett I'm going to let her speak for herself um, to explain a little bit about Patwa and a little bit about kind of this um, embedded hierarchy, I guess, that we have um, with the language that we are forced to speak or expect our patients to speak and expect each other to speak in science. So hopefully this works. It worked a little while ago, but um, it's really long, but I'm just going to play you a little bit. And we have a whole lot of wonderful heritage, songs and stories and proverbs and all kinds of nice things and our language of course the basic thing is the language which we have been talking for 300 years <laughs> yes dear and my aunt you know, said she don't like nobody can say i know language at the time she begs you know about the whole rhythm of the language my child you see it, it, it's because all this folklore and this culture that we have come from all the different people who have lived in the country you know and we just use it and now we have our a real West Indian, a real Jamaican culture. For my aunt wrote to say, when the Asian culture and the European culture work upon African culture and the Caribbean people, we stir them up and blend them to a flavor. We shake them up and move them to a beat. We wheel them and we turn them and we rock them and we sound them and we temper them and laugh the rhythm sweet. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> So, um, as I said, I think that's probably why the feelings of using it, you know, in a clinical setting felt so wonderful to me. And if that felt so wonderful to me, I wonder what it feels like for patients to be able to talk in their mother tongue. So, oh. and we have a, sorry, Louise. <laughs> so, um, so that kind of led me on. This wasn't so much as a slap in the face. Remember my little pigtails running along. This wasn't so much as a slap in the face. It was like this, like, slow realization now I'm like really <laughs> is it that bad really it's not just me really it's not just in the clinic really um and so it felt as though there was kind of a bit of an elephant in the room um that there was a bit of a conversation um maybe that we needed to have about where does genetics sit on race and where is blackness within genetics where are black voices within genetics where's the history of black people in genetics um so that's kind of where I got to then and the PhD kind of sits firmly in that in some of the work that I've already been doing just thinking about where these ideas of of race come from but this is black history month so we're going to reflect very specifically on black history so um this is a, a slave market in Portugal um, so I went to Portugal and I did an African walking tour around Portugal. And the thing that I learned about um, Portugal was this um, Prince Henry, the navigator, a navigator that never went anywhere. Um, <laughs> um, he uh, decided that he wanted to kind of break away and, and, and get into the slave trade, but not the Arab slave trade. So he needed a way of distinguishing between the, the types of slaves. And he'd done this kind of exploration around um, Africa. And so he first was the one, his scribe anyway, because maybe he didn't write for himself as well as not Ceylon ships, um, described um, Africans as a homogenous group. 
um, that even though there were Africans of different um, phenotypes, ethnicities, cultures, he needed to group them all together to describe this trade in Africans. So that was in about the kind of 1400s. And so the first um, slave auction was an, in West Africa. And then, um, and then in the same year, it was, um, they were brought to Portugal and it was described as kind of a, a miserable and desperate scene. So then we move on to kind of the use of race and ancestry in science. So these ideas around a hierarchy of race, a race that deserved to be where they were, meant that you had to place them at the bottom of this scale. And these ideas kind of continue to perpetuate through um, society, through politics, but also through science as well. And so we'll all know that um, Carolus Linnaeus divided the human species. And these ideas by Johann Frederick Blumenberg also kind of um, uh, further, kind of went further onto these categories. And not only were there categories, but there were traits, behaviours, values associated with these categories. And these kind of hung around for, for centuries. Darwin, um, when we're talking about the, the Black presence, we might know that um, Darwin learned his taxidermy from a, 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 an enslaved Guyanese man who on arrival to Scotland, we don't know if he was free before he got there or when he got here, um, John Edmonston, um, but uh, slavery was abolished by the time he got to Scotland. So he was definitely a free man when he was in Scotland and had learned taxidermy and Darwin kind of just didn't like medicine. Um, and so he kind of took up his interest in taxidermy and first learned it from, from him. And the reason that he did it at the start was actually just because it was a bit cheap. I'm going to learn to stuff birds from a blackamoor. I believe an old servant of Dr. Duncan. It has the recommendation of cheapness if it has nothing else. Um, and as complicated as that history is, he actually in later kind of works reflected on the excellence of skills um, that, that he acquired um, from this man. Similarly, around that time, these ideas of traits that went with being black or and being Negro, as was used at the time, they're unhappy race. They are strangers to every sentiment of compassion, are an awful example of the corruption of man left to himself. And then this is a really important moment when Europe decided to sit down and draw lines all over Africa and divide who should have what. And it's really important when we think about science, because when we think about diversifying science and who's doing research and what categories they're using. Lots of the categories, even within the science that's done within Africa is done around these colonial lines, which as scientists, we know don't actually make any genetic sense, but they're still being used. And these are lines that led to war and conflict, often because of these ideas of traits and behaviors that went with these arbitrary groups. So this um, image, again, from the kind of late 19th century, around the time of um, kind of the ri rise of eugenics. Um, I find this Im image ironic because actually what it depicts is um, given what we know about recent studies in Neanderthal DNA, which is the similarity of the um, primitiveness of the African and early Australians and how close they were to Neanderthals. So 1948, so we had eugenics, we had Nazism and the, and the war ended and then this was the first um, international conference of um, genetics in Stockholm and it was felt as a way that it could bring kind of um, an end to some of the conflict. It was really controversial because people didn't know whether to invite the German scientists or the Japanese scientists and should we just ban all of them and then there was a good list of the good German scientists who were allowed to come um, and the two things that were never discussed at this um, conference to resolve the conflict um, were racism and fascism. But also in 1948, what was happening, and this video doesn't work, sorry, there was a song by Lord Kitchener, I was going to play a little bit of music, but it's not working. Um, it's when the SS Windrush arrived in the UK. So we can see that this like really clear juxtaposition of what was ha happening in, in the world of genetics and what was happening in the world for um, people of, of um, African Caribbean descent. No, 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 I'm not going to do it. <laughs> So this um, tussling between, um, so, you know, when, uh, when I speak to my grandmother about, um, and she arrived long after the Windrush, but it still wasn't an easy ride um, for lots of people who came from the Caribbean to the UK. Um, and that ride did not only sit within working on London Transport and working in the health service, which lots of them did. And this is kind of an, an example from the health service. So 
um, the, the treatment of um, sickle cell um, anemia um, was one that, um, say, so Dr. Dane Elizabeth Anionru, he's on the far left-hand side, um, was the first um, sickle cell nurse in the UK. And she actually learned about um, the condition and her responsibility, I guess, of doing something about um, the disadvantage and discrimination and lack of service available for people with sickle cell anemia um, through her black activism in, in, the, in America. Um, and so this was 1979. This was the year, I'm going to tell you, the year after I was born. <laughs> um, and um, so the reason that I, I also um, have, have put her up is when I started to um, genetic counselling, you had like different rotations. And one of the rotations that I wanted to do, because I was just always really like, OK, but how are different communities using genetic? And there wasn't like a rotation for it, so I just made it up. So, um, so I made up this rotation that was called like culture and genetics or something. So I did eye, I did heart, I did whatever. Um, so I had to go and like find all these places to go and um, do placements in. And one of the places that I chose to go was to the sickle cell um, society. Um, so that sickle cell and thalassemia um, centre, and it was across the road. So when I started genetic counselling, um, the hospital that I went to was brand new, like the Queen had opened it and we started the, the year that it opened, it was glossy, it was gorgeous. Um, and then I went to visit the um, sickle cell and thalassemia centre and you had to like come out and cross the road and it was like in a dusty building on the other side. With, and, and it just really struck me then, and I didn't really know a lot about the history and the difficulty of, of sickle cell anemia to be taken um, as this, in the same way the other genetic conditions that are just as prevalent are taken within, within genetics. Um, so, um, and I also had the pleasure of meeting Dame Anion, and I'll talk about that later because I'm going to show off. Um, okay. So then around that same time in 1980, a group got together and, and established clinical genetics as a speciality in the UK. So genetics is hurtling forward. Amazing things are happening. This is the number 15 bus. My grandma used to drive a number 15 bus. So um, sometimes in the summer holidays and particularly at Christmas, I used to ride the number 15 bus, play with the paper receipts, but also you get to see the lights on Oxford Street. So I always used to sit at the back and watch the lights. So this is my metaphor of genetics hurtling, hurtling down the road and amazing things happening. But while amazing things are happening for in, in genetics, not so amazing things are happening for black people at the same time. So around this time, the um, Human uh, Genetics Commission inquiry, it was about 2010, um, introduced this inquiry into the DNA database um, because the DNA database, which was a resource for the police to keep genetic profiles um, of those who had been convicted of a crime, when it was looked at the database, actually, um, it was seen that almost every black family in the UK had somebody represented in the database. And I remember going to um, a talk by Alec Jeffries, I think he invented the human um, uh, the genetic profile and um, him talking about, you know, doing science and then science being used for the thing that it wasn't for, that actually um, it was to put, bring families together in immigration. He was talking about that those were the things that he was most proud of that, um, that, his, that his technology was being used for. So some really big kind of recommendations came out of this, um, you know, huge dis disparity that was, that was being seen. Genetics keeps rolling on. Fantastic. Great stuff. Um, 100,000 Genomes Project happens 2018, wonderful for so many, for so many people, um, but then we still have these same conversations, this same disparity, this same idea that perhaps this hurtling forward, this speed of, of precision medicine that we are going towards is leaving people behind is exacerbating um, the inequalities um, that we see, is less useful for people who are from particular backgrounds and underrepresented groups, that perhaps this genetic bus that is hurtling towards our wonderful genomic future um, has got some people sat at the back, not looking at the Christmas lights, and maybe some people aren't on the bus at all. So it was with this um, growing um, awareness really that I started to think about you know more about my research and my and my PhD journey and as part of my research one of the questions that often gets um, banded about when you speak to scientists or when you read literature is what well, if race is so awful let's just drop it then you know why don't why don't why don't we just drop it so why don't we just drop it well we we don't live like that do we we live in a we live in a, in a racialized world and sometimes this the statement 
reminds me a bit like, and I know some of you will know what I'm saying. You know when people say, I don't see race. Like this very privileged notion, I'm pondering it, I don't know where I've come to it yet. That in genetics, this idea that rightly so, sometimes genetics has no biological, biological reason, race doesn't have a biological reason, genetic reason to be used, sure. But we're doing genetics for healthcare, we're doing genetics for outcome, we're doing genetics for equity. So actually, if you just drop it, perhaps you might make things a little bit worse. So um, this report into um, the Royal Society um, kind of looked at um, the ethnicity in STEM academic communities um, and found a number of um, key findings that there was um, significant variation in progression. And even though proportionally, um, black students from undergraduate and postgraduate were increasing over time. There was like this hemorrhaging through the pipeline. So it's the retainment and, and not people, you know, getting in. Um, and also that this data was showing that um, um, applicants that for the three UK early career fellowship schemes are not fully representative of ethnicity or gender profile. So there was a low representation of black, Asian and multi-ethnic groups for the UK. So the society felt that they needed to address these trends, in particular, the very low participation of black researchers. And you may have seen this recently, this report recently on the Wellcome Trust, that um, following the um, development of their anti-racist toolkit, that there were, oh, there were um, still insufficient progress in particular areas. So while there was um, good work being done in lots of different areas, there's still a long way to go. And some of the good work, I hope, <laughs> is my PhD. Um, and as I said, I'm not gonna speak very much about it, um, but this PhD um, was developed specifically to look at this use of race and ethnicity and ancestry in genomic research. And I hope that I'm showing you why I think that that's really important. Um, and why I think it's really important that that, um, that work, I agree with how this, um, this was offered, um, was that somebody who was from a black or minoritized background should be the one to do this work. And I think very carefully about how that will impact the way I'm looking at data, the way I'll ask questions, the way I'll analyze it, and we'll speak a little bit more about what the benefit of that representation and diversity in research is. So remember, I kind of showed off a little bit about me, Dame Annie Onwood. Um, so uh, one of the other things I, I, I um, was wanted to do was when we talk about representation, is most genetic counselors will tell you that they tell people what they do and they don't know what they do at all. So that was one thing. Um, but then also because of all these la 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 ring around the world, I realized that most people probably had never seen a black genetic counselor either. Um, and so um, I spent a lot of time talking to a friend of mine, um, Dr. Makarori Mavis, um, just like on the phone complaining about the world um, and um, so then we decided to just do like a public conversation called genetics engage um, and we've been kind of buried so we haven't had many more conversations but I went back to look at it when I was doing my talk and there's some real like gems on there you should go and um, check it out um, so um, we uh, Dame Annie Onwu because of her recognition of the discrimination in in sickle cell in the 70s um, was overjoyed that we were trying to do this and offered her time for free and came and wowed everybody on Zoom um, to speak about her life and her responsibility um, of that she found was put on her to represent um, to represent black people in in the struggle for sickle cell anemia. This is Malebo. Remember, I told you that Malebo and I are friends. So then when I started Genetics Engage, I was like, hey, Malebo, come have a chat with me and let the world listen. Um, so that was kind of our first talk. And then we did um, lots of talks with um, different particular researchers from different black and, and minority backgrounds or whose topics were around that in different areas, mostly of, of, of clinical um, genetic research. So this hurtling bus, um, the Genome UK policy paper which says our vision is to create the most advanced genomic healthcare ecosystem in the world, where government, the NHS, research and technology communities work together to embed the latest advances in patient care. So I, I, I went in the policy thing, I put it on HTML and I just searched diversity and it was mentioned nine times and they were all around access to services and data sets couldn't really find anything very strong or powerful about workforce. And so 
there is lots of work around that area happening. But I really feel as though it should be at the front of the bus in this hurtling forward of our genomic strategy. Um, and while there are other programs that promote research with African and Caribbean populations um, outside of the UK, we have a huge diaspora community in the UK. And are we really doing all we can to look after the futures of those who are here and not neglected in this? So if you're on TikTok or just alive, you might have seen that there's a new aerial. <laughs> Um, so this picture represents representation matters because I don't know if you've seen all the little girls running around really happy um, that Ariel's got dreads or Ariel looks like me and so, um, so, so it does. We know that representation matters but also representation is hard um, and so that's the other thing that I mentioned kind of very early on that I wanted to come back to. Damani Onru spoke about it, I've experienced it that when you're asked to do this work um, you know, when we looked at the statistics of who gets funded for what research they do, the reason that black researchers are talk, thinking about community and population is because we have lived experience as well as professional experience, but that's not rewarded always as much as it should be or supported as much as it should be. And that's perhaps why this is the first PhD of this of its kind. So I believe that diversity in the workforce improves clinical care and adherence, that diversity in samples um, include, improves diversity in samples, and people trust those who they identify with. And more diverse topics get researched, but as I said, however, the research about underrepresented groups often falls to those themselves to do the work, and it's often less funded. So it's not just me who thinks this is important. Um, there was this paper that um, was kind of arguing for more diversity in, in, in workforces, healthcare workforces, and found that regardless of the background of the people in the workforce, they felt more equipped to see people of a more diverse background. And it really resonated with my work at Manchester, where I was the only black genetic counsellor for like years and years and years. And when I left, um, my manager kind of did her um, you know, goodbye talk, and it was all really teary. Um, but one of the things that I was most honoured for her to mention was how I had changed their department, or how I had um, changed the way that they think, the way that they talk, and the way they are more comfortable with seeing um, patients. So, you know, this um, representation that we want is might be very far away, um, but actually any steps that we make towards it can make a, a very big difference. So then we have to think about the lack of diversity in higher education, as we've shown, and in leadership. And what does this lack of diversity cause? So higher numbers of discrimination and harassment, missing the mark or kind of tone deaf deliverables. And these have financial implications and limits the innovation. We're just not quick enough. If you dream of a utopian kind of future where somebody had said, we need a truly representative reference genome, how much further we would be if we were the first people to think of that. And so we see evidence of this all over um, in the NHS, mission data, diversity data. There's enough data to kind of prove what lack of diversity can cause. And so if we diversify it, what can we do? We can diversify thought, boost creativity, wider range of skills, and an understanding of the structural and systemic barriers because of people who have lived those. And this attracts more diverse staff, retains more diverse staff, and helps us to engage better with society because we understand them and we are them. So my questions to you before we go to questions are to ask yourself now that I have thoroughly, I hope, made the point that we need to do something. Um, what can you do today? What can you do tomorrow? And what will you keep doing? So I'm going to give you a cheat for the first one. So this week is Black in Genetics Week. So um, Black in Genetics is an organisation to um, promote the Black presence in genetics. Um, and it started same time as Genetics Engage almost, it was kind of around, around the pandemic. And yesterday, somebody retweeted what I said on Black in Genetics last year. So this year, I'm going to tweet that I spoke to you in Black in Genetics. And so one of the things you could do today is um, go and follow them and amplify their voice. Um, and that's it. Thank you. Sasha, for a wonderful, varied talk. I don't think we've, any, we've seen anything like that on campus in quite a few years, including pre-pandemic. So thank you so much.